welcome to the North Tech webinar series powered by Acubits. For centuries, mankind has uh, used Polaris, the North Star, to navigate and explore the world. Inspired by this, the idea behind our webinars are to discuss technologies, innovations, and explore its impact on navigating us to a better world and a brighter future. My name is Shamir Taha. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at Acubits, and I'll be your host and moderator today. This webinar series is an initiative of Acubits, a leading business transformation and engineering services firm focused on emerging technologies such as AI and blockchain. Welcome again, everyone. In today's episode, I'm joined by industry thought leaders and experts in the oil and gas sector, where we will talk about the opportunities and challenges in the oil and gas around process automation. Today, we have with us an amazing lineup of panelists who are experts and thought leaders in their fields. Let's start with a quick round of introductions from our panelists here today. Let's start with uh, Mr. Hisham. Hisham, would you be kind enough to introduce yourself, please? Yes, this is uh, Hisham Methat. Uh, I am uh, a senior APM uh, consultant, asset, uh, asset performance management. I'm working in uh, Adno Gas Processing. There is a section in IT called uh, IT Operation, and I am responsible for the engineering applications. Nice meeting you, all of you. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Hisham. Uh, next up, we have Mr. Chandrasekhar. I have 37 years experience in upstream oil and gas industry. I work for Kuwait Oil Company and ONGC India. And uh, most of my work is connected with uh, workflow improvements and project engineering. And uh, it's about uh, cryogenic processing, oil and gas stabilization, and downstream compression and export. And uh, in my last project is an interesting project in KOC that I was uh, tasked with uh, uh, integra integrating and improving uh, up workflows between about more than 30 teams, uh, right from subsurface, surface, uh, production, maintenance. That gave me a tremendous challenge and uh, you know learning curve to you know to understand what is the importance of uh, workflow automation and uh, digital analytics. So, uh, so we went through a complete learning cycle and implemented to some extent. So still a lot more to be achieved. And thank you all. Thank you, Chandrasekhar. Looking forward to hearing more from you during the course of this webinar. And uh, we next up, we have Mr. Biji Thomas from Betroy. Biji. Hi, good evening, all. Uh, my name is Biji Thomas, and I work for Betroy as a principal consultant. Before that, I was with uh, Megit, uh, and before that, with General Electric, uh, primarily with the asset performance and condition monitoring business. Uh, focusing on Bentley Nevada business, uh, and uh, I had a regional role of uh, project pursuit on capital projects. Uh, glad to be here. Thank you, Biji. Last but not the least, we have Mr. Pramod Agrawal. Hi, uh, good evening. Um, my name is Pramod, and I work for Automation Anywhere. We are a, a robotic process automation and AI company, and uh, I've been here for a year as a CTO uh, for this region. Um, prior to this, I spent a year in the energy industry with Baker Hughes, and we were looking at uh, an AI platform for uh, predictive monitoring of uh, a variety of assets in the oil fields. And before that, I've been uh, a career sort of Oracle guy in enterprise software. So looking forward to this conversation with the uh, all of you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Pramod. So uh, by expert panelists, I, I was absolutely right. We have some amazing minds here who have some very credible experience in this industry. So before we begin, uh, for the audience, the listeners and the viewers here today joining in, a warm welcome to you all. Uh, we will start today with a panel discussion, followed by a feature presentation, and finally open up the floor for audience questions. Feel free to use the chat window to leave any questions that you may have for our panelists here, and we'll do our best to answer them towards the end of this session. So let's begin our uh, questions for the panelists here. So according to the International Energy Agency, the global energy demand is expected to fall by 6% in 2020, seven times the decline after the 2008 
global financial crisis. The year 2020 brought great challenges to oil and gas companies as well, setting the ground for an even more challenging 2021. To remain competitive and emerge stronger in the wake of the pandemic, oil and gas organizations need to discover new paths for optimal operational efficiency. Hisham, what's your take on the performance of the oil and gas industry this year? Um, you know, what's the emerging trends uh, in the space? What are the challenges brought by the pandemic? And how does this set it up for the next year? Uh, uh, now, because of the um, uh, COVID situation, which is going around, uh, the need for digitalization uh, became uh, actually more demanded. Actually, we thought that there might be a kind of cut cost in all aspects, but uh, no, actually, it was exactly the reaction, the opposite side. They are spending more on the digitalization and they are uh, planning more and more actually uh, to uh, budget for more, uh, uh, more automation like uh, next year. Um, uh, especially right now that uh, working uh, uh, the availability of engineers it's not uh, that much available especially in uh, dangerous areas of the of the site and uh, we have started actually several uh, kick off uh, of uh, project this year because they couldn't even wait uh, till next year, and I will uh, spotlight on one of the major projects when I start my presentation. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, does anyone want to share any other thoughts on this uh, topic? I, I can say from my exp uh, our experiences with the oil and gas sector in, in the India Middle East region that uh, what Shansar spoke about is absolutely on the dot. Um, we're seeing a lot of demand. In fact, I was honestly surprised that even some of the public sector energy and utility companies in India, they're buying tons of software. I, was, I did not expect that at all. Right? And sort of confirms that people are recognizing that this is really an opportunity where mindset shift is happening. And how do you capitalize on this mindset shift with bringing in the right technology for the right use cases? Right? So I think this whole idea of remote work uh, where people used to do dang dangerous jobs. Uh, now there is a recognition that the technology is there. Mindset shit has happened. So why not just marry the two and get on with the program, right? So I think in that sense, there is a huge recognition of the value that the digital or digitalization can bring. Uh, and it has become sort of the core of the enterprise. So CIO, may have been an operational guy before, but CIO is now a strategic guy suddenly, right? So you want to solve those problems today uh, with the tools that are available. And I think uh, to the benefit of the industry, I think a lot of technology work that has happened in the last decade or so with cloud computing, cheaper computing, AI, automation, I think that's all, and mobile, I think for sure, and IoT, I think they're all coming together it's in a very interesting way. All of this technology convergence is being, uh, is found in accelerator or catalyst in the form of COVID. <laughs> so I think that's the interesting part of what's happening today. Absolutely. So uh, like you said, you know, this seems to have catalyzed the need for digital transformation and business transformation in general. Um, so we, we are seeing across the board, not just in this industry, but across various industries, people have kind of, understood the need for you know, these technologies, whereas it was a good to have, now it's a must have, and kind of propel that even further. Um, thank you for that. Uh, so um, Chandrasekhar, every industry today is focused on productivity and efficiency improvements and oil and gas sector mm -hmm. is you know, just one of them. In terms of technologies, a lot of investment has been made in technologies such as computer vision, intelligent OCR, NLP to AI, so what are the major opportunities that you see in making oil and gas business more productive? See, fundamentally, let us see the what fuels improvement, efficiency improvement initiatives. What exactly fuels? See, the, at the fundamental level, a sense of vulnerability is necessary. 
if you want to achieve higher safety you need to get sense of vulnerability if you need to achieve more productivity you need to get that so covid 19 has given more than adequate share of sense of vulnerability now worldwide there is no company or no organization can claim that they don't feel vulnerable they, we are all vulnerable we, and we completely you know not only somebody telling us everyone is really feeling that so that has fueled a lot of uh, initiatives top from top management and commitments towards uh, business continuity initiatives so the umbrella for all these initiatives may be business continuity fueled by a pressure from from top management and governments and uh, shareholders to deliver some profitability so let us see what what oil industry has done in the last uh, you know vijam mentioned 2008 from 2000 roughly 2005 to 2020 last 15 years the average returns to shareholders in oil industry is about 2% worldwide so the, this is partly due to you know various reasons we don't need to go go about the for the reasons but partly due to an inadequate uh, utilization of manpower utilization of resources inefficient uh, inefficiency that has crept into the system and plants are becoming older and older so worldwide we haven't seen many new refineries or gas plants coming up so people are, now owners are interested to achieve a life lifetime extension of the existing obsolete equipment or aging equipment let's say call it aging equipment so there is simply no budget for replacing the existing refineries or old plants so people are must now due to the vulnerability sense of vulnerability due to shareholders pressure whatever you may call it there is absolute pressure uh, on the management to get to deliver a better efficiency and better equipment uh, uptime so the the buzzword the magic word is equipment uptime if you have your equipment running for most of the time you get maximum output of that if you have your people working with high efficiency you have the maximum output so coupled to the higher efficiency of the workforce an equipment which is more in, uh, high, having higher integrity will deliver the magic so in this sense what are the tools available to any management so we have, we have seen uh, conventional systems we have seen computerized systems but th- these systems are dumb systems you know you just set a pre preset rule to that and they just follow the rule they don't capture the changing in the <coughs> change in the market change that has to take take place to achieve a better efficiency that has to that is being done offline if you take the case of refinery every day the production engineer put, set, sets a new uh, you know linear programming algorithm uh, to get the manually what is the optimum mix of products then he manually has to download that into the recipe mix you know why is it happening why can't the system understand the market demands and then automatically reset it and why can't why, to be happen more than a day you know all this requires a tremendous you know constant uh, you know commitment from top managements to achieve higher efficiency and optimization this ha- must happen and this has to happen there is no other alternative like isham said iot and uh, cloud deployment and a connectivity between the plant and of course operators hate it when the, when they think that oh, okay plant has to be connected to internet but there are safe ways of doing so and whichever plant is better connected the underlying result is automatically enhanced efficiency and all the tools that has been talked about they are all supporting the same you know same road map mm-hmm. there is no going back actually we have to think about iot industry 5.0 5.0 or 4.0 we are not no more talking about 4.0 and we are talking about you know future Uh, you know we are now less and less companies talk about uh, on premise cl- cloud deployment they are more open to at least discuss about you know real cloud deployments of their tools so these are all steps towards that absolutely thank you for that uh, chandrashekar um mr biji uh, talking about performance improvements we've heard about asset performance management and operations optimization in oil and gas could you help us understand a bit more about this and how do we optimize performance management in oil and gas so sure, thank you uh, I, i think uh, there are people attending from outside the oil and gas domain as well 
so I just wanted to say that there were a lot of uh, doubts in people's mind that oil and gas industry is a sunset industry, of course, but you know how far it's going to last. This is a kind of lingering question on people's mind. So uh, based on some reports, uh, primarily from OPEC and other reports, at least till 2045, oil and gas is going to be the predominant energy source for many uh, of the developing countries, right? So it is oil and gas is going to stay at least for the next 25 years for sure. Now, a lot of things will change in the next 25 years while it is staying. So, uh, so, so that, that, in that context, now coming back, uh, knowing the oil and gas industry, which is going through this, uh, what do you call pressures, market pressures, uh, uh, during COVID, before COVID, it went through uh, deep uh, price uh, uh, issues. In fact, uh, it went to negative uh, uh, dollar per barrel. And uh, thinking that now, as in addition to what Chandra said, the return to the shareholders. So the production costs or operational cost is getting very closer to the selling price and the pressures and the uncertainty and a lot of uh, what you call uh, encroachment into the energy market by renewable energy. So the industry itself is going through a lot of changes and this market pressures. So coming back, uh, continuous optimization of operation uh, and production as well as asset performance is one of the key things which will help uh, companies to you know stay afloat as well as to be in, in profit. So it's very important uh, to, to examine that in that context. Now, oil and gas industry, you know that it is, you know, upstream, midstream, downstream, all those segments, all of them have got their own uh, tools and practices, which are currently in, in practice, uh, in, in some shape or form, uh, as far as the production optimization or asset uh, performance management and optimization is concerned, it is there. However, there is a huge room for improvement. And the huge room for improvement uh, uh, is not only because of the technology advancement, but also I think oil and gas industry is not the fastest adapting industry to technology changes uh, because uh, of the regulatory nature, the safety systems in place, a lot of standards. So in my role as a project uh, pursuit person for GE, I've seen that many new projects, new projects, greenfield projects. Uh, companies are reusing specifications which are 10 years old. And, mm -hmm. and you know, so, so when they are using those in the design, in the front-end engineering and design, uh, there are very little scope of uh, changes uh, during the building of the, you know, plant. Of course, there are opportunities to change later. So, uh, oil and gas in industry is kind of late, I would say, in terms of adapting to newer technologies because of legacy reasons, uh, the way in which how that industry is operating. Uh, and uh, the, the departments within the oil and gas industry, apart from the, uh, you know, the leaders in the, or the oil majors, or uh, the, the newer, uh, what do you call, uh, strong points like Atnox and Aramco's, uh, and although the majors, I mean, they are adapting, you know, faster to the technology. Uh, so uh, what all things, as to answer your question, you know, how you can optimize uh, and uh, asset as well as operations. So, so first thing comes to my mind is the information quality. Uh, so a lot of new low cost, high, uh, uh, low, low size sensors are available now compared to 10 years before communication has drastically increased. And, uh, but the companies are operating in the same way as they were operating 10 years before. And they are not aware, I mean, most of them are not exactly aware where do they stand in terms of their performance. They may be aware where do they stand compared to last year uh, or with respect to you know, overall revenue versus cost but they may not be aware how they are doing well with their peers or compared to industry benchmarks because there is no dynamic comparison. Uh, so uh, so that, that should be number one, you know, where, where, where do we stand? 
uh, with respect to the, the best in class operators. Uh, there are many uh, benchmarks, uh, metric to compare. And then what kind of information is required to make adjustments, right? So that is from where we start. And uh, uh, overall process optimization, when we talk about is it, we are talking about uh, you know, improving uh, something within the constraints of certain other things, right? Primarily improving efficiencies or, or production where uh, if using fewer resources and uh, while being safe operation and while being le lost, least impact uh, to the environment. So putting all that into the constraint and taking advantage of technology, there is a lot of uh, uh, review we can do with respect to, do we have the right information quality? Do we have the right uh, information available to understand where we stand? So from where there we make improvement. Second is the process itself, like process has also changed, a lot of process improvements. So do we want to continue with the existing process? Do you want to review the existing process and change the process itself? I mean, I'm talking about the process design or uh, tools which are, or, or uh, equipment which are used in the, in the process itself because that is designed with certain licenses and certain processes. And third thing is the, uh, uh, continuous optimization of the production constraints, uh, which is adjusting the load, load management, or adjusting the temperatures or pressures or operating parameters in a continuous way uh, so that you get the optimum uh, result. As Chandra indicated, you know, the days are not far when, when this you know, plant themselves will optimize based on the market uh, uh, value of certain produce. Right, uh, and, and the last thing is the uh, improvements we can make for the people. Uh, no, sorry, before that is the, is the assets uh, itself. So asset uh, performance is a key thing already mentioned. So uh, there were traditional uh, routine maintenance or maintenance regimes which are established in those plans and those are set in uh, from the day the plan started. So technology change and practices change. They are making, let us say, uh, incremental improvements, but that is not a fleeting change. And, and they are making adjustments, buying software, buying systems, trying to implement, but a uh, lot of investments are being made for sure. But how much value they're getting out of that? What is the real uh, return on the investment on those technology, how it is impacting on the bottom line? That measurements are not very clear all the time. So, you know, as a general industry trend, investments are being made. So uh, going forward, I think one of the things to look at is that what are the new uh, cost-effective methodology to acquire the right information, how the right visualization uh, and, and the right place the data is available in a consistent manner, faster decision-making and better decision-making using tools uh, and continuously optimize. You know, and then then comes to the people. Uh, now, uh, COVID has accelerated the mindset of digital, but in an existing oil and gas plant, I don't know how far this is impacted and how much it will take to really for people to embrace new technology. If, if tomorrow somebody comes up with a new machine with embedded artificial intelligence inside the machine, I don't know whether the oil and gas industry is ready to accept it. I don't know whether the policies are in place, what are the you know, the, 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 I, I don't know how much the uh, industry is aware, where else uh, automation is utilized very well, and what are the best use cases, where are the good examples of ROI. So I think those are the points, plus the uh, culture change, uh, uh, you know, help for the people, because a lot of people are going to be, uh, need to be retrained uh, to use the technology. And, and, you know, you can reluctantly approach the technology, or you can uh, very passionately embrace the technology. So how do we make those happen? So these are my thoughts on how you know, oil and gas industry can make further improvements uh, with the asset as well as operational optimization. Thank you, Biji. So um, it comes down to, again, people, process, and technology, right? And, and at the end of the day, the, the challenge is always uh, not just technology implementation, but also gearing up for a change management and adoption of these technologies within the industry. Um, 
Hisham, in, in your work, I'm sure you would have come across many process automation examples. Can you share with us any examples or known results of uh, such within your uh, work? Uh, can I share my screen to show something or you just need oh, a plain sure. answer to the question? Uh, feel free to share your screen. It's, it's fine. Uh, just a moment. Now, uh, to answer your question, I wouldn't take uh, much time, but uh, this is one of the projects uh, that uh, I have been involved in it uh, from the early beginning until the end. Uh, some projects uh, was not managed by me. Actually, it was managed by colleagues. It, it was managed by another sections uh, within ADNOC. But this one precisely is one of the projects that I have uh, started from uh, the early beginning. Now, uh, because of, of many uh, incidents that we have uh, heard about uh, in oil and gas industry, there was a certain era and certain period that you, uh, you used to hear that uh, uh, big names having explosions, having uh, uh, a gas leak, uh, loss of uh, contained uh, material, uh, now we started to look for something to uh, to uh, eliminate this kind of risk and uh, and damage. So this is where we started ten years ago to um, uh, look for uh, inspection management system. Uh, so uh, why we did look for inspection management system? Because first of all, uh, the the risk rating of the asset it was. Uh, a personal opinion uh, of the engineer based on his experience. So um, uh, I don't want to, to use uh, like harsh words, but if he is not in a good mood that day, maybe his expert judgment is not that good uh, that day. So depending on the human uh, feedback for uh, making an assessment of a critical asset, it was not uh, something that we would like to keep on uh, proceeding with. Uh, you have also uh, that uh, you are uh, uh, rating the risk at the moment for the asset, and you keep living with this assessment that you have done, but actually the risk change by time, and this is something that needs to be considered. Uh, after inspecting the, uh, the asset, uh, you can... Uh, you put a recommendation that I have to replace so and so. I have to do coating for a certain pipe and something. And sometimes this recommendation, when it goes into paper, um, uh, it can be left in a drawer and uh, nobody will look at this recommendation and it will never be processed. Mr. Hisham, uh, tell me, may, sir. Uh, sorry to interrupt. You. May I request you to put on a slideshow so that we get uh, viewers get bigger image? Yes. Right. Just a second. Are we fine? Yes, thank, thank you. you. Okay, sorry for that. <laughs> okay, and uh, one more thing is the cost of inspection. Actually, without an automated system, the cost on, of inspection is very high. For example, that you have a piece of equipment that you have to inspect uh, uh, every five years. Rich companies, they say, why I have to put myself on the edge and inspect it every five years? I have money, I can do it every three years. And this every three years, he is being uh, so careful, but actually the life cycle of the asset can go more than that. But he is just spending extra unnecessary money just uh, to, to, uh, to do um, extra inspections that he could have saved. And uh, now, and some people do exactly the opposite. Uh, instead of uh, too much inspection, he say, no, I can delay the inspection to till the maximum, till, till it reaches the threshold. And of course, this might uh, damage the equipment. And accordingly, it, uh, it can uh, make a kind of shutdown and loss of uh, production. So in general, eliminating the damage, it was a dream in this uh, number of years, 10 years ago. So now, accordingly, we have started our roadmap in 2010, we have uh, implemented our inspection management system. 2017, we have implemented the risk-based inspection uh, 581, which is uh, data-driven, the decision of the risk and assessing the, 
and doing an assessment for the equipment is done by uh, cal a calculator. Uh, for every asset, you have more than 300 pieces of information that goes into uh, a very complex calculation, and it will give you the uh, criticality rating and what is the mitigation uh, of the risk that you need to perform with automatic processing of the recommendation that comes out of that. No human intervention is going from there. I am not uh, canceling the role of uh, re the resources, the expert resources over here. As one of the gentlemen over here mentioned that uh, the resources should adapt how to use this technology. Otherwise, it's, it's all useless. It will not work as expected. And this is one of the project challenges that you will face uh, when you implement such project. After that, in 2018, we have implemented uh, the mobility of our solution. And this year, actually, uh, we are implementing the uh, RBI for pressure relief devices, because actually inspecting pressure relief devices, uh, it's uh, pretty tricky. And uh, we have, and currently we are doing a POC for thickness monitor uh, sensors, uh, which actually send you the signals and the thickness uh, of the pipes uh, in a wireless way straight to your platform. Now the project, the project over here uh, went. Uh, through a process first of all which was a very painful uh, part is the data collection part uh, you are collecting data for uh, we will go there is a special slide for the data collection actually it was it's the most important part over here and why you are doing this and you are saying that my data is in place and everything is available again uh, data quality uh, if any environment tells me that they have a super high quality data in their uh, systems, uh, I will consider this piece of news a science fiction. This thing doesn't exist. <laughs> and I am sure so many people actually over here, they, they agree with me. The first challenge, you are dealing not with the new technology, not with the people. The first challenge is your own data in your own organization. Uh, once you start implementing uh, stuff like that, you will be surprised how your plant were surviving uh, sites were surviving last uh, few years. Some of them were surviving actually by God will. Uh, I don't know how, how it happens. Uh, so you collect the data and after that uh, you gather the data in the form of templates, Excel sheets, whatever, and you upload it to the desired system that you have uh, in place. After you upload the data over there, you run the analysis calculation on this data. And trust me, it does take time. These calculators, they are, uh, uh, there are big platforms, special servers running this uh, kind of calculation. Uh, it's not very uh, quick. It takes time because the number of data to be processed is big. So imagine if you have a refinery or something and you have thousands of data and thousands of assets and the records, uh, 300 field for every asset, and you are putting all of them in a calculator, and you are asking the calculator to calculate all of them. Sometimes it takes, uh, for the initial phase of the project, sometimes it takes 21 days to finish this kind of calculation. Um, after that, it will give you an analysis and the risk rate. You have to review this kind of analysis and to take uh, generate a recommendation if you need to take action about high and medium uh, risky uh, assets. Now, what is our goal? After saying all this fancy stuff, what is our goal? First of all, to increase uh, the safety because an RBI, uh, if something exploded or something, uh, there is a special calculation how many uh, what is the area that will be impacted? How many people in, is in this area? So, so it, this is increasing the safety. Increase the productivity of the uh, of inspections. You uh, do the inspections in the proper time. You are not doing it too late. You are not doing it too early. 
the calculator will give you actually the task to be performed and it will give you the interval every how long you need to inspect this uh, asset. Uh, in the old school, there used to be a fixed frequency. It means you bought uh, a piece of equipment. You uh, do the inspection every 10 years and that's fixed. But no, uh, by time, uh, the equipment gets old and the risk that this equipment is facing is getting higher. So fixed frequency or fixed time to inspect, it's not the right thing. Every time the calculator runs after every inspection and according to the situation of this uh, uh, equipment, it will tell you the next inspection date, which varies. It's not the same. And old equipment that failed several times, it's not exactly like a new equipment. Uh, decrease the uh, productivity losses. We are avoiding unnecessary shutdowns. Reduce the cost of the inspection. Change the frequency by time, as I said, and accordingly prevent uh, catastrophic uh, damages. Now, uh, the assessment of the asset. Uh, first of all, you start with the assessment preparation, information gathering, and then you uh, do the risk risk assessment on the information that you have gathered uh, and then you plan for your inspection and after you do the risk mitigation and you fix the necessary things you do a review over there to make sure that it goes back to the green area what is the information that you need it's from everywhere from our document management system, from the design sheet of the equipment, uh, the operation manual, uh, PNID drawings, uh, the piping classes, the fluid property, the fluid that goes inside the pipe. Is it acidic? Is it alkaline? Uh, current operating uh, readings and condition uh, and special instructions. And if there are even some uh, historical inspections that have been done, you take the results and you have to feed it to this calculator. The technical output, what is expected from this project on daily basis. RBI calculator start, inspection plan is in place already. Um, the inspection is performed and a report is generated. Risk is spotted and it should be mitigated with action. And then you update the RBI assessment with the fixing that you have done, recalculating happens again to show you the new uh, risk. And as you can see the risk matrix over here, it will show you which one is on green zone, red zone, and uh, accordingly, you can have a full picture about thousands of equipments that you have. Now, the uh, we were unlucky that the, um, uh, the inspection management system platform that we bought, which is the best of the world. We have bought it actually after um, uh, long research. Uh, it's a, a GE product. Uh, I don't want to market any platforms. This is not the purpose of that. But actually, the um, mobile solution that comes with it, it's, I don't know how to say it, it's a lousy mobile solution. Uh, um, it's, it's an HTML so HTML, it's like you are opening a website inside your phone. And actually, uh, you cannot say that this is effective for an oil and gas industry. So what happened, uh, I have done uh, an in-house project. Uh, we have built uh, an Android application. Uh, and we have taken the same data structure and the same fields in, in our inspection management system platform. We build it over here and we have built an interface between them. Uh, so this mobile solution is 100% uh, in-house. And as you can see, we are using this kind of device, which is uh, coming from Ecom, intersectly safe uh, against uh, explosion. Again, uh, it can handle uh, uh, if it falls down uh, to a certain uh, strength and stress way. And uh, um, it can handle heat uh, until a high degree. So the combination of the uh, platform and mobility and uh, this kind of devices, uh, it made a very high ROI. It freed up the engineers 
uh, to do, uh, they can do right now the inspection uh, in a faster way and they can save the rest of the time uh, to do something else useful, a research or, uh, or, uh, um, or a meeting a vendor or, uh, or doing some uh, other analysis. Uh, it gave them uh, a space of time instead of taking the information on paper and then he goes back to the office to feed it again in the, in the system. Uh, this year we are doing the thickness monitor sensor wireless. Actually, we are, I am in the middle of the project right now. Uh, we have a company that is doing uh, a POC. They got the thickness monitor um, uh, sensors. It's like a belt. It goes in, around uh, pipes. So instead of taking the UT device and they go to the uh, pipe and they read it and he keeps writing it down, no, this sensor it can work anytime. You can fetch the thickness information uh, anytime. Yes, I agree. It doesn't, uh, uh, the, the reading doesn't change easily. The corrosion and erosion, it doesn't affect uh, the pipe in five minutes. Definitely, it needs time. But some areas, it's very dangerous to go, uh, for a human to go and get uh, the information from there. Sometimes we used to get a specialized vendor and we pay for him a lot to go for this areas with his special equipment to take the readings and come out again. So uh, this kind of sensors, uh, it's doing the job and we are just touching what's under the water and see if it will work with us or no. Now, the future um, uh, plan that we have is to uh, fully integrate with the uh, IOW, the Asset Health Manager. We integrate with the sensor directly and we can read the temperature and, uh, and, and, uh, and pressure and all, all this kind of stuff. And even take signals from the uh, uh, pressure relief devices if it's on and off uh, without wasting time. It should be reflected uh, on the fly. Uh, you have we have the corrosion prediction we want to apply uh, right now we we have a calculator that tell us the remaining life that this is the speed of the corrosion in this pipe and the remaining life is seven years 10 years 30 years but we don't know um, uh, we don't we cannot predict the corrosion itself so we want to apply artificial intelligence in this part so it can predict the path of the corrosion, uh, how it goes. And we also uh, want to integrate with the 3D module. We have SPF, Smart Plant Foundation, and we would like to uh, integrate our inspection management system with the Smart Plant Foundation to make it uh, seal. Uh, there are so many things. We have thought about implementing chatbots. You can extract the information actually by voice commanding, taking actions by voice commanding. Uh, you have the new uh, technology of uh, um, augmented reality. Uh, you don't have to go and check any systems. You just raise your phone to a certain equipment and it will give you tags about the, the, the operating uh, parameters uh, over there on the phone while you are really far away from that. But uh, I don't have something real in hand and a real requirement to implement those. That's why I did not put it here. I took too long and uh, time, I'm sorry, and thank you. Uh, I hope I answered your question. Maybe I did the presentation early, I'm sorry. No, not at all. Thank you so much for that, Hashem. I think those, those were very insightful um, you know, inputs that you've given us and a very interesting perspective into opportunities and to oil and gas, I mean, from, from a broader perspective as well, in terms of, you know, where, you know, some of these emerging tech can actually help, you know, be it AI, machine learning, automation, there's, there's so many things. And I think that's, that's definitely an area that, uh, you know, technology should be focused on. Um, so with that, um, you know, I'd also like to, um, you know, address the audience again. Um, there's a Q&A section, please leave your questions for the panelists, uh, and we will answer them at the end of this uh, session. Um, Pramod, um, what are the challenges or key requirements for adopting robotic process automation? Can any oil and gas company 
um, embrace RPA from day one? What are the what has your experience been like? So um, I think I was very sort of keenly watching Hisham's presentation and very interesting to see the whole sort of life cycle of this inspection management system where he talked a lot about the data cleansing, data collection from multiple sources. And having spent an year, uh, year at Baker Hughes, I can definitely say for these projects, uh, and in general, I think in the operational areas, given that these systems have been in place and they were put in place at different times, some may have maybe been put like 30 years, 20 years, 10 years from today, right? So if you look at where the data lives today, and if you want to make any kind of AI successful, right? AI is, requires data, which is uh, sort of in a way represented in a very canonical form, regardless of where it is coming from. So where we find most of the cost goes in an AI system, the development is understanding data, collecting data, cleansing data, and enriching data, right? And what we are finding is that if, if that portion is not designed well and designed at a uh, sort of level of cost, uh, then the whole AI project can become, I think, very, very expensive to run, right? So in fact, some people say that 80% of the cost lives in that particular section. So I think we, where we find uh, automation technology, automation bots is, can you do something with the data at source where it is coming from, right? And I think that's one great area where uh, automation can start yielding results very early because as the data is being collected, the bots can work on the data and put the data in the right form and with the right quality into the uh, AI application analytics, which is then churning the data and giving you certain meaningful insights, right? So that's one area where we find bots to be extremely helpful. And today the bots technology is at a place where it can run on any operating system. It can work with any end, end user application. It can work with different data streams and it can therefore accelerate that part of data collection to data enrichment, putting the data into the right application. So that's one area where I think uh, automation can be very helpful. The other areas where we find in the back office operations, whether it is finance, uh, for example, billing, collections, uh, procure to pay process, right? So <clears throat> simple things like if you can reduce the errors in billing, can improve your customer satisfaction and it can have positive impact on your cash flow, right? And these are all areas where the systems and the processes are very well understood, right? The, the, all, all that is missing is putting this layer of automation bots in place where if, for example, you are reading data off of documents, for example, whether it is invoices, POs, or bank statements, or other, uh, uh, other billing related uh, statements. So you can take the data, use AI, document understanding AI, which we, we build and get the data out of these documents, which is otherwise waiting for a human to act on, put that into the application, then use bots to create those invoices for your customers, which are error-free, and therefore you reduce your billing cycle essentially. Right? So I think there are many, many areas, whether it's in the back office or in operations, where you can use bots and uh, document understanding technologies to uh, get better efficiencies in all of these processes. The, the other area where I think uh, Asham also alluded to was the conversational bots, right? So I think conversational bots or what are now also called as sort of natural computing interfaces, where you are interacting with the computer systems as if you would with another human being. I think those are also great places to start thinking about how do we transform the experiences of employees, operators, customers, where these digital interfaces can translate the user intent into what this system needs to do in the backend. And then what the system needs to do in the backend can be very easily automated using bots. So now you have a front end, front end that is reacting to the human intent and you have the backend that is fully automated, right? When you combine the two, I think you get what the user is really looking for and then computing does not become an additional task. Computing is part of your natural working environment, right? 
And I think that's where we are seeing a lot of queries coming in from, uh, from our customers in oil and gas space, energy, electrical utilities companies, where they're trying to really see how do we make these experiences much more human, right? And completely change their experience. And I think as the energy companies or oil companies become uh, modernized, not, not just from a uh, uh, digital perspective, but also how their portfolios change, I think that the mixed asset classes that they will deal with will require them to really think about the customer and the employees and in ways that they have not seen before, right? So when I was a bigger user, I used to hear about the fact that uh, the oil and gas industry is losing talent, right? And the new talent that you're onboarding doesn't want to work the way the engineer that was hired 30 years ago used to work with the systems, right? And I think, how do you bridge that gap in the expectations of the employees is by bringing in these digital or digitally enabled experiences of working environments in which they can be effective, right? So I think these technologies around AI and automation are giving you that opportunity without having to rewrite everything that you had before, right? I think rewriting everything is going to be just impractical and inadvisable, right? So therefore, you have to use these technologies to give what the stakeholder needs, but be able to capitalize on what you have already, right? And, and I think that's where the industry is going. We are seeing huge transformation projects being taken up. And cloud is certainly in, right? It is no longer a question that should I use cloud, right? A lot of people are beginning to use whether they are use, bringing it onto their own private clouds. For example, they could use AWS or Azure or Oracle private clouds, or they're just saying that let the public cloud vendor manage it because they have armies from a data security perspective that you would never have as a small organization. So it is really accelerating the whole whole change. That's what we are seeing. Interesting. Thank you for those valuable insights, uh, Pramod. Um, so with that, I'd like to open the floor for questions from the audience. We've already have uh, a few questions come in. Um, so let's start. Um, we have a question from Yalo Thomas. Um, so hybrid cloud is a way to go for modernization in oil and gas industry. Um, any of the panelists want to take that up? I think Pramod, you kind of touched upon yeah. that. Shamil, mm -hmm. I'll tell you my own experience. I implemented a cloud uh, deployment on premise. By the time we completed the project, the hardware was almost getting obsolete. So how right. do I convince my management to spend uh, millions of dollars on hardware, which will, which I knew, I know that will get obsolete by end of the project. It makes no sense. You know, then my management told me that oh, if you want to go public cloud, okay, you have to, you, not, that means me as an employee who is championing that, have to guarantee to us that there won't be any data breach or whatever. That, uh, Promo talked about bots. You know, some of the bots uh, will stay with us. Some of the bots have the habit of running away to our customers, mm -hmm. our, our client, our competitors. You know, the bots are not very trustworthy. Okay. Uh, if you know what I mean. So mm -hmm. we want robots. A robot, uh, I'll uh, let me coin that, you know, it's something which remains with the owner, a robot remaining with the owner. So we want honest bots. But uh, you know, they, we do. We sometimes we still have bots which are uh, going out of control, so the data breach can always happen. So, but the data will always stay with the owner. But the applications can be going to the cloud. The application means that when the application runs, the data can be accessed in as a temporary access, so that by as soon as the application finished running, the data can be cleaned out. You know, there, there can be always a in between solution. So basically I'm talking about a hybrid cloud where the resources are available and resources are pretty much flexible. When I need to run a simple application, I only pay for my simple application. When I need occasionally a very large application, something like Hisham's application, uh, you know, which takes 21 days on-prem, you know, if uh, that kind of resources can be allocated, I can see a, a value for, such applications that uh, temporarily uh, uh, hardware and software resources can be accept, uh, you know, uh, can be arranged to reduce that to a few days, not, if not 21 days. 
then as soon as that runs run there is no need to retain that hardware and software resources with the with the company we can release it so it makes a lot of sense to have applications running in the cloud it makes a lot of sense to have the data on prem i completely respect that so the marriage between these two seems to be the private cloud sorry i, I i'm hybrid. sorry the hybrid, hybrid cloud so this is my perspective I, I i may be wrong but this is my perspective in fact we uh, we learned a lot in our last one year of the cloud journey ourselves where we have had this saas application for automation for about a year now and hugely popular in customers um but we were constantly struggling with this question of data sovereignty data security and uh, about 6 months ago we released an option where data can live on prem but the software can run on the cloud and access data only on a need basis and then uh, do not store the data so uh, and in many cases people are also saying let's just have a cloud enable where uh, we we completely run the application in house but let the software be managed to cloud right so there are all varieties of options that are emerging but i think hybrid cloud in general is a is is a new concept and it is emerging because people are realizing that not every application and every digitalization need will be met by one particular provider and you also want to be i think fairly risk averse right in in putting all your eggs in one basket so that's another reason the the third point that i think is very important from hybrid cloud perspective is the cloud if you think of it as a just as a virtualization layer to run your underlying computing resources to turn them into utility mode that software has become quite standardized today right and that software can turn any asset into a utility computing class resource and whether you look at ibm or google and oracle is really trying that there is this view that let us not uh, let us not just have to have only one way to shift every application to one cloud environment mm -hmm. you can run anything anywhere but orchestrated through this one layer of this virtualization software and i think that has huge cost benefits to the customer it gives them a lot of flexibility as well so where this story will actually end nobody knows but at least in the in in the interim you you have got options that the only choice to do cloud is not to do either all public or all private but you have options in the middle right thank you pramod uh we have a question from arnab gupta from kuwait oil company uh, who is an inspection specialist his question is to mr hisham uh he's actually got a two part question um first question is have you considered in harmonizing total asset integrity management with rbi output for example chemical injection automation dynamically mapped with the corrosion rate of a particular corrosion circuit instead of operator in intervention um so this is to hisham but i mean anyone else if you uh, feel you want to answer that question uh yes uh first of all you have to understand that you are uh, speaking with an it person i know the language of uh, of uh, engineers i have been living with them for more than 15 years i am the hub between uh, the the vendor the engineer and the it at the beginning they were speaking chinese <laughs> to me i didn't understand exactly what they are talking and uh, your question actually is one of the questions that were raised before and uh and i am i am sure so many it people over here are surprised what uh, what are you asking about the answer is uh, yes uh and uh, now but it's not up to me to consider put in your mind that i am a business enabler uh, engine for uh, the business user or the end user who are the technical team for uh, maintenance and and inspection this was put on the table for uh, a discussion uh, actually this happened for the last year and a half but till now they did not take a decision in addition to that uh, also we have uh, a challenge that uh, we have different um, 
systems covering similar functionality. So we are in the process even to get rid of some of them or to make them shake hand because this is one of the challenges that you will face in every environment. You will find uh, like uh, your information is scattered like a spider between so many uh, platforms. Uh, so uh, yes, we did consider it, but I am waiting for their uh, final decision to implement. Uh, regarding the uh, uh, automate uh, anywhere we are using this uh, this platform actually uh, internally i'm not using it in my projects but uh, it gave lots of uh, uh, benefit to the uh, finance and uh, hr people are using it also and um, and uh, uh, contract contract commercial people those people, they deal with uh, lots of paperwork. They have uh, lots of repetitive uh, jobs to be done, taking information from uh, tenders, taking information from applications uh, that were filled uh, by, uh, by, uh, uh, in, in during recruitment. And they have to keep filling it in, into the system. So there is no workaround actually for an automation over here until we have implemented automation uh, anywhere. Uh, so it started to take care of this area. We are observing the output uh, of, uh, of the system, how it's working. It's actually switched on, let's say, six months ago after long uh, implementation uh, cycle, uh, it's doing uh, good, uh, but still people are not familiar. They, they are not adapting it. We are expecting after this adaptation happen that things will, uh, the performance of the system and the output will increase more. We, we, we are looking for more scenarios actually to add to uh, automation uh, anywhere tool to, uh, to serve us. Maybe I have jumped to another area, but I hope that I have answered his question. Hisham, I would like to talk to you. Tell me, sir. Uh, ah, okay, <laughs> I'm here anywhere. I'll, I'll set up a separate meeting with you. No Thank problem, you. no problem. As long as you invite me for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Hisham, for that. Uh, we have a question from Mishari Juma. Uh, the question is collection data is collecting data is a challenging part especially if the plant is ancient and has many changes at several of years so what's your recommendation for improvement and to have effective data to start anyone i think um, i think maybe the question relates to more how the data is collected at source uh, that's right from various devices so I think I can, where I can add is that I think some of the ancient systems may not really have the kind of uh, data collection device for the lack of a better word. And I think that investment will have to be done anyways. I know a lot of digital sort of oil fields, they have done a great job in the last 20 years. But if, if your equipment is even older than that, then that certainly poses a problem. But I think the equipment that have been installed in the field, so far as I remember from my bakery days, they all have data coming out of them. Right? It just needs to put in the right systems to get them, uh, get them into a historian or some other uh, system like that. So uh, I don't have exact answer, but I think that the uh, the uh, systems technology is at a place today where uh, suitable uh, devices. Uh, are available uh, depending upon what you're looking for to get. But I think from automation perspective, if you think about once you've gotten the raw data out, I think that's where the automation can then start to help in uh, getting it into the right systems, doing the right kind of massaging from format or uh, enrichment perspective, that it becomes an actionable data. And I think that 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 can become a very useful driver to justify why I should digitize that data collection from this ancient equipment as the questioner calls it to begin with. I think unless you can show that value, what you can do with that with data in order to make the asset productive or predict say faults or what have you, 
uh, that later journey of the data can be useful in driving investments in digitizing the ancient equipment. Uh, Pramod, uh, in addition to what you said, there are see, two kinds of data from, from the plant. There is what's, what can be called a static data. That's the data sheet or uh, nameplate data, the exact model of the equipment and what are the machine clearances when the machine was started. These are the uh, available, if you talk, uh, ask me, a number of times in my experience, there were uh, questions about the clearances in the machines and the alignment diagrams and all. These diagrams are nowhere available for, for the maintenance guy. He has to drive uh, a long distance to get that uh, out of some uh, uh, obscure manual. You know, why it should happen like that? So as far as possible, data should be available to everyone through electronic means. And uh, even if the ancient drawings are in uh, A1 or A0 size, there is still a way to digitalize that one, uh, maybe in a different format, if not simply scan and put it in, in some drive, but to digitalize in more readable form and uh, in Excel sheets are for more friendly, user-friendly sheets. Someone has to invest in that. Someone has to believe that that is useful. Right. And usually in organizations, the problem is the champions. The champions are not available. So everybody wants this kind of data access, but nobody is willing to take the headache of actually championing it. Someone has to do this. Once it is done, everybody will use it forever. This is one thing, the static data available from manuals and name plates and all. The second is a dynamic data. If, what if I change the bearing and I am still using the world set points for my vibration? You know, because some the people who have changed it have retired or have gone to another place and people simply don't have not kept the management of change records properly. Yeah. So this is the dynamic data. Dynamic data can be helped to, to, for cleaning up by RFIDs. As far as possible, I recommend to use RFID technology for at least what is available in front of you so right. that you, know, you can use, like Hisham has shown, mobile devices, intrinsically safe devices, and uh, so, some of the devices come with RFID recognition technology. So that you, know, you, exact, you know exactly that you are, you know, from which part of the equipment and from which model of the sensor you are accessing the data. I think one uh, comment I can add to this, though I don't have as much experience as the rest of the panelists here, is that I found that there is a bit of a disenchantment about sensorizing the equipment because sensors can be very expensive. And the data has not been used to give insights that it was promised <laughs> when the investment was made. I think, therefore, I think the responsibility is also on uh, somebody who's proposing these projects to digitize these equipment or data collections. It's like, what can I do with the data, right? And I think industry has spent a lot of money in, in buying expensive sensors from companies like Baker Hughes, where I used to work, but they haven't been able to show the value in the end. Right? Data has been collected, but not, not enough has been done with it. So I think that's where I think the whole life cycle, if you look at it from examples like what Hisham showed from an inspection management system perspective, if you can build that whole value proposition, I think you can start to put investments in the right place. Well, Samir, I want to add <clears throat> on the top of what uh, Pramod and Chandra said. Uh, so apart from those data, also the questioner might be thinking that the plant is ancient. Now it does not have the right sensors. And Pramod said that, okay, industry is spending, okay, for, for all this, digitization, but are we getting the ROI on that investment? So I would suggest that whoever is proposing that change uh, should think about what kind of data is required for the optimizing and maintenance uh, in a right way. Mm -hmm. uh, so starting from maybe criticality analysis, uh, what kind of failure modes, what kind of uh, detectability of those failure modes, for which what kind of sensors are currently available. Now, with respect to the cost of uh, uh, digitizing, uh, primarily on an ancient plan would be to lay uh, cables and in, in connecting those sensors to some kind of data gathering system. But now we have low cost sensors, which are wireless, and we could easily deploy it on assets. But before that, you need to uh, prove the business case, right? What is the investment? What are we going to get out of it? What kind of sensors are the right one? 
you know, how the failure modes can propagate or how frequently do you need the data, et cetera, so has to be analyzed. So basically uh, one step back and uh, start a look, look at uh, what is available, what you want and for what reason, right? And, and sure. then, you know, put the ROI case. Absolutely. Thank you for that, uh, Biji. So uh, we have one last question, but I think we've answered that. The question was from Rajit Krishnan. Thank you for those questions. Um, so it seems like we are running out of time. So um, let me uh, conclude by saying that the convergence of RPA plus other digital technologies like advanced OCR, workflow orchestration, chatbots, and cognitive automation will definitely help oil and gas companies cope with you know, increasing customer expectations, generate probably newer revenue streams, um, and optimizing operations in general. Right? So that's, that's the um, thing that we've uh, concluded on. For instance, using a chatbot along with an RPA can literally digitize an entire customer interface and enable smarter conversations like what uh, Pramod mentioned. And this feature can be added with most oil and gas use cases to enhance the user experience on you know, bot level execution. Also, if you look at OCR capabilities, uh, they will help in, you know, validate, uh, like you said, invoice data, reduce the cost, time, and effort needed for invoice processing. AI and ML can also be successfully combined with RPA uh, in the process areas of uh, hire to retire, cost allocations, um, and so on. Now, despite several challenges that we've talked about, the scope of implementing intelligent RPA processes across oil and gas enterprises is massive, and it comes with the promise of radical digital transformation. So I'd like to thank the expert panelists here for joining us today and sharing their valuable time with us. I hope and I'm certain that our viewers and listeners would have gained a wealth of knowledge from you all. Once again, thank you and look forward to having you with us in our upcoming sessions. Also, thank you to the wonderful audience for joining us today. Uh, I see that there are a lot more questions coming in. Uh, I think you know people have not had enough time with you all. Uh, we will take down those questions uh, and we'll share them with you. Um, and um, you know, the audience, please drop us your email addresses and uh, we'll be sure to respond to them uh, as soon as we can. Thank you again and uh, see you all on the next webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sham. Thank you, Pramod. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Chandra. It was a pleasure, guys. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. thank you all.